Hello, hello. Welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. My name is Shamel, and I am so happy to see you here from YouTube, from Facebook, and Philly Cam. Yes. If you have not done so, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. And for all of those of you who have done so, thank you. As you come into our program, whether we are live or whether this is in repeat, please let us know where you are. I love to know where you are. Um, I got to tell you something about my guest today. So Adrian and I are both members and soon to be past presidents of the African-American Genealogy Group in Philly. So any AAGG members out there, you know, say hi to Adrian. Let everybody know you're from the best genealogy group ever, of course. Um, all genealogy groups are great. If you are not a member of a genealogy group, why not? Seriously. Why are you not a member of a genealogy group? You need to be with people, crazy people just like you. You know your family doesn't care about that little nitpicky stuff. So let me just tell you one thing about Adrian, and I'm going to bring my fellows on so we could talk about what's going on today. So one time when we were having our, at AAGG, we were having like one of our, you know, multiple decade anniversaries, maybe 30 years or something. And Miss Othella, who is one of our, you know, she is our queen member. She probably was in her 90s or close to it. And she told me to, you know, come on over here, young lady. She said, young lady, I am so proud of you. I am proud of all that you do. And I said, thank you so much, Miss Othella. And she said, but when you take to uh, read those minutes for the meeting, you need to slow down so I could take my notes. And I thought, I have not read the minutes for AAGG in like a decade. And I realized she was talking about Adrian, not me. And I said, okay, Miss Othella, I will make sure that I slow down. So two minutes later, here comes Adrian. And I said, Adrian, I just took your beating for you from Miss Othella. And when you read those minutes, you need to slow down so she could take her notes. And I just love Miss Othella. Miss Othella is no longer with us, but love her to death. So anyway, let's get started with our show for today. So what are we going to talk about? Today, we have two new topics to do quick starts on. And one is sounding off on the sound decks. No, this is not 1990 or 2000. These guys told me, they promised me they had a reason for this like multiple decades ago that I think, you know, I don't know. What do I know? Uh, topic. But they're going to sound off on it. And our special guest, who I just told you about, I took the beating for Adrian Whaley. She's going to be on today talking about placing your people. So without further ado, let me bring my buddies on here. Columnist Jim Beidler. How are you, Jim? Mr. Genealogy tip of the day, Michael John Neal. How are you guys? Doing well. I'm good. So what is with this uh, topic that seems like, you know, crazy? Are you promising me that this is like relevant to Soundex to what to this century, to like this decade now? Yes. <laughs> okay. and, and, and I and I would base I would base my affirmative action answer on that phonetics are all, always important to be able to get all the spelling variations of your names. And names are a genealogist's stock and trade. Uh, and unless you put together the universe of possibilities of how that name may be written, you're going to miss records of your ancestors. Another reason why it's Jim made a great point. A lot of a lot of sites is one of the search options. Instead of doing an exact search, a sound deck search is one of those options that people have. And from the standpoint of problem solving and troubleshooting, when you don't find your person, if you're choosing another way to search and you don't really know what it's doing, 
then you don't know what you're doing. And, and, and so that's another reason for, for talking about it. Yeah, um, it, you know, well, many, many things that have become kind of automated now, you know, like drawing deeds, you know, that used to be a laborious process. Now there are so, there's software to, uh, to do that. Oh, uh, you know, for the, for those states, not, not like Michael's where it's all rectangles, states like mine, Pennsylvania, where it's the old meets and bounds stuff, but still, and all, it's a good thing that you kind of at least learn the old way, uh, you know, so that you have some understanding of the background, you know, rather, rather than just, oh, the computer does it. That makes sense. That makes sense. So are you guys ready to sound off on the sound desk? This sounds like an old commercial. Remember, what was it? Sound off. One, two. Sound off. Three, four. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm not on my game today, but we'll, we'll get there. All right. Step one. Let's start with step one. What the heck is a sound X, first of all? What is a sound X? Well, and and there there are several sound X's that have been developed over over time, and I'll be I'll I'll be honest, I don't know which one uh, came came first, but I've seen it. The, where I first encountered it was again back before the internet when we were dealing with uh, uh, microfilm copies of the U.S. Census, and there there was a sound X index to those censuses starting in, in 1900. And it, in that case, it created a code of the first letter of the surname and then three, uh, up to three uh, digits, numbers, that was based on grouping consonants together uh, under, the, under the same number. And Michael, did you want to weigh in, Mr. Mathematician? Right. I mean, it's basically what it was. It was, as Jim said, the, the initial first letter of the name was used. There were three digits that were used after that. Those three digits were based on the, the three next consonants, vowels are stripped, um, unless they're the first letter. And then there were one, uh, one through five. The consonants were put into groups that sounded similar. B, P, F, and V were all one number. I forget the number. M and N got the same number. And it was an attempt to group. When you gave a name a number, then everything that, as we'll see in the, in the, de the demonstration, um, everything that had the number N400 started with an N. The next consonant sound was an L. And then there were no other consonant sounds. And so every name that had that set of letters would get that same number. And then it grouped all those names together um, back when there was indexes made that are on cards. Today, that same cons, when you do a sound index search, basically, and we're going to talk about this, it pulls up every name that would have had that number. You don't have to use the numbers when you search, but having a, a good understanding of how the sound index works allows you to troubleshoot when you do a sound index search and then still can't find your dead people in that in that index. Yeah, and there and th there are variants to the sound X, like there's one that is, is especially helpful for uh, Jewish surnames. I believe it's the the Deitch Mokotov sound X. I, I may think have you're that. right. Yeah, and and so there there you know there's some quirks and foibles to uh, to each of them, but it uh, you know it's it's what Michael said. You you want to try to know the background of what uh, you know what you're doing. And sound X works better with English names that have an English root or a Germanic root um, than French or Eastern European names uh, for the most part. But we'll, you'll, some of that will make a little more sense when we get into the, into the presentation part of this. Yeah. Ah, I'm back. <laughs> so we know what the sound X is obviously now, right? <laughs> All right, let's move on to step two, which is to list the surname variant. So while I bring that up, what does that even mean? Well, this this goes back to what I, I said in the beginning about what I call the universe of possibilities of spelling variants that your surname might be found in. Uh, you know, it's never it's never one spelling for a surname all the time. If you if you think that, you know, you've missed a lot of your genealogy. And a name that I've done a lot of that I actually did a surname history book. Oh my goodness! Thirty years ago, it's all, almost uh, was D Dob. The modern name in Lebanon County, Pennsylvania, is D A U B, uh, and uh, 
you know, the, uh, the D, you know, like Michael was saying about uh, how the sound X groups letters that sound close together. Well, the D's and the T's sound close together. The B's and the P's sound close together. And this tiny surname, uh, only four letters, has 77 different spelling variants until you swap out all those. These are the real life ones I found. Just about one, uh, one man in the Dobb family, his name is Dealman Dobb. Uh, he was a Revolutionary War soldier. Uh, went, went through three wives, um, <laughs> mar married his last one when he was in his 60s and she was 20-something. Uh, wow. He died. He, he lived all the way to 1849. She outlived him to 1876 and was still receiving his pension from the Revolutionary War. In, wow. in in the 1870s but uh yeah his, his both his names could be spelled in many different ways that's crazy that must drive you not now i see why you drink why you have your <laughs> wine subscription <laughs> do we have another who do we have who's this suave guy here okay this is yeah this is my uncle and because you asked for a picture so you got a picture i um, love it but these are some of the i'm not sure why i'm pointing to the screen but these there's a lot of different variants for this name these are a few of them and as we'll see when we get the codes a lot of these names are what we call sound x equivalent um the well, when when the vowels are different it doesn't affect the sound x because the sound x ignores vowels um, but when a vowel and a consonant are interchanged, if you look at the, the second and third variants there, the, the U has been misread as an N, which if you think about it can happen. Those two number, those two names would have different sound X numbers mm -hmm. and a sound X search for trot better, the one you've got the arrow on right now would not pull up any references where it's spelled above it with an N because mm -hmm. those are not sound X equivalent because they don't sound the same. Even if you don't remember the numbering system, and that's fine, those names don't sound the same, and so Soundex is not going to pull those up. Um, and, and I'm just curious, the, like the Trant Vetter with the N, do you consider that? I, I'm going to. I don't consider that. I mean, when I Trant, that I that's probably consider, somebody mistaking in it. An that, end for you, right, right, that's that's an okay. index entry issue. Okay. Somebody okay. reads the. I don't consider that a spelling variant, but if you right. think. If we if we remind ourselves that we're using transcriptions by people, then in this name, that's one I got to look at. I've also got to look at the fellers on the end. If that and any name that has a, a double T or a double L or an LT in it, you got to think about where that cross on the T got or didn't get, and that can create some additional variants too. And of course, those will be those sound different because if if I trade those two T's for two L's, that's a different sound. Um, so Jolene wants to know where are you documenting the various spellings of a surname? I would just keep track of if you're trying to keep a list, I would have a word document where you keep track of those so you know what they are. When you find variants in a document, of course, you would transcribe that exactly as it was written. But in terms of doing your having your list so you can search effectively, I would have those in a word document. I mean, I, the, some of these names I've done so long, I don't need a word document. But and I would yeah. also put it in a uh, like if you're like stuck on your and you like which we should be our lineage software. I would put that into like a research note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. All right, I think you have another one here. Uh, let's see, who do we have? Of course, we have the Neils. Yes, and this this is another. The first two spellings there. Um, while the first one irritates me beyond belief from a sound <laughs> standpoint, they, they're the same. They're the same because again, the first letter is the same. The vowels don't matter in terms of sound X and one L sounds like two L's. So, so those why, are, have the why, same. why are you so irritated by because her? I, because I have issues. We're not going <laughs> to, that's a whole nother show. That's a whole nother show. <laughs> um, but those two, but the, the first two are sound X equivalent. And because this guy is Irish, it's assumed that, well, if you're Irish, you got to have an O in front of your name. And so sometimes an O gets dropped there. That would be, now I know the O is a vowel, but in the land of sound decks, if the first letter always matters, no matter what it is. And so O'Neill has a different sound X code from Neil. And if I do a sound X search for O'Neill, it's not going to pull up any. Neil 
references. Okay. Uh, if you're just doing a Soundex based search. So that's step two. What is step three is to get the Soundex code. So how do you get the Soundex code? I remember we used to have the, we had these sheets and we used to do it on these sheets. So you gave a couple of places that you like, Michael. Let's take a look at those. There were two. Now, the first one is where you actually get the code at, at Bradding. Uh, there was one on Roots Web, but I, it, it, Roots Web is kind of ish. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of come and go on Roots Web anymore. But th this one at Brad and Kathy, that's where I get my Soundex codes. And the nice thing about it, you've got a small screenshot there of it. In that box, you can put as many names as you want. So if you've got all your variants for Huffenmauer typed out in a Word document, you just copy all those variants for Huffenmauer Schnurmurgen in that box, and it will give you the Soundex codes. You don't have to enter them in one at a time. That's one thing I like about it. Yeah. Um, is you just type, we'll use the reverse sound decks thing in a little bit. Um, that's where if you've got a code for one name, you can see other names that are sound decks equivalent. And the kind of what Jim was alluding to some variants that you might not have thought about because you were stuck on your main variants. Yep. Um, okay. And so let's see, what do we have for, I think we should be on to the next step, step four which is to check the sound decks of the variants. So why is that helpful? Uh, simply because you may find new variants that you had you know, no idea to, uh, to check. Uh, and, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, th I, th I think I am a slide ahead you're, of me. You're, yeah, you're a your step ahead. <laughs> um, so this is for those variants. If you go to Brad, the, the, the Brad and Kathy site that we mentioned earlier, and you type in those names, I've got these are just five. There's a lot of other variants for this name, but this list this is list of Soundex code for those names. You don't type that in the search box. You don't use that anywhere. But when I see those, that all those at the bottom there, where you see six three one Trot Vetter, Trot Feller, Trout Fetter, those all have a code of six three one T six three one. What that tells me is. If I type in that third spelling where it's spelled the right way and I tell the search interface to do a Soundex search, it will find it spelled the right way, T-R-O-U-T-V-T-T-E-R. It will also find Trot Feller and Trout Fetter um, because those are Soundex equivalents. So when I see their equivalent, when I see they have the equivalent number, then I know that. Now, I know Trot Vetter and Trot Feller have different consonants in them, but Soundex only grabs, if you were paying attention, taking copious notes, Soundex <laughs> only grabs the first three consonant sounds after the initial letter in the name. And those L's and T's are way down the line. So Soundex doesn't care. I get that we care, but Soundex <laughs> doesn't care. It's too far down the name. But the N, we talked about with the N, where that's a, a consonant has been has replaced one of the vowels you see over there when you look at the code that's got a different code the, so see, the sound x is, is it sensitive look look the sound x is okay it's, it's not sensitive. sensitive about the n-e-a-l it's hanging in there with you it's no, got I'm you looking at the, I'm Why still back, you I'm still I'm still on the trot better people oh, okay. I'm still on the trot better people <laughs> okay. see on that that, that second one there, there's an N where there was a U in the original spelling. And see, the code number is different. Completely. And so that reminds me, when I type it in the right way and do a sound X, it's not going to catch that trant better because that has a different code. And, of course, beginning with the F has an entirely different code. Well, the letter the letter's different because the first letter is different. It still is 631. And if you think about it, because all those other letters are the same as the, as the other one. Yeah. And then when you run out of letters, uh, I think when we do we look at Jim's Dow people, they run out of letters too. But in my name, you get the consonant. We got, worth it, you know, we're minimalist here. So <laughs> it's the N and the four for the L. You got to have three uh, numbers. You're out of letters, so you just use zeros. Um, okay. Let's move on. Two. That's the slide I thought. Five, which is to go ahead and list variants with the same versus different sound decks. So help us with this, Jim. Yeah. Uh, 
and and this is to to demonstrate that it that two things one one is that it's going to hook you up with with a lot of irrelevant names oh <laughs> uh, you know and it's merely because they have some of the same sounds but uh like in this in this case for dob oh uh, there's d-o-b-b there's d-o-p-p there's dove which which is what Dob literally means in German is oh, uh, yeah. is dove. Now the, the now the 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 thing about it is is if you go back in time, the name actually was Taub or Tauba, uh, which means deaf person. But I like dove as, <laughs> as a symbol of my Dob family. But uh, but no, here here especially D O B B. You know you know to for records especially in the 19th century where somebody might have been writing something down the classic thing i think of as an english speaking clerk hearing a pennsylvania german speak uh, you know he might not have asked him you know how do you spell your name he just he would just put down what he was most familiar with from english <laughs> d-o-b-b so Okay. A quick, a quick comment before we get away from this slide. Sure. Uh, you could get the this list of names. I'm assuming, or you get a similar list on that slide where we had the websites. This was the second website. Brad the and reverse. Kathy, the right, reverse. The reverse. Brad and Kathy yeah. would give you that D100 if you didn't know that, and then you go to the reverse site and it would give you these, um, ah. these names. So it's not one site or the other. Cause someone in the ch uh, chat, apologies. I don't remember who it was asked, which site do you like better? So really you use both. They kind of right. work together. One is going, one is giving you that code. And then the other one was the, gives you the, the reverse, like Jim talked about those other additional possible variants. And like he mentioned, some of those are going to be totally bogus. There may not be there. And some won't be listed. When I put in the, uh, code for trot vetter that number it's tardif and tard something else i don't even really get my names for that so if your name is kind of unusual it might not even appear in that in that reverse list um, let's look at you still your, want to give it a try let's look at your variant other variant your variants for neil I think. and it's kind of like with it's kind of like with jim some of those are are practical um some of those are, are not quite so likely to have happen, especially the Neelys, at least in my experience and my family. But some of those are, are variants you might not have thought about. And mm -hmm. as Jim mentioned, the clerk not knowing how to spell the name, maybe you couldn't understand your ancestor very well. <laughs> There's a variety of reasons why these things can happen. It just, it just gives you a good reminder of what some of those variants uh, could be. All right. So we went through, like, to me, it is kind of a sem somewhat technical talk, but it has real world application. So before I review the steps, like explain why this is useful um, as we're doing research where we don't have to figure this out. We just have little drop downs and boxes. It goes back to when you when you search a database that has this option and you choose this option and you don't find your person and you want to know what variants uh, it, you didn't look for this if you know this if you're familiar with how the sound X works then you know that oh i i typed it in this way i did sound X, but that's not going to get it if the first letter is an f that's not going to get it if the u is read as an n or the o is read as a c or whatever craziness could um could potentially happen yeah, and a good a good rule of thumb when you're when you're doing searches is you should never just be doing one search uh, of one spelling uh, because there are you know not just the phonetic ones but there are these ones where the letter was was mistaken. Uh, and I think somebody had asked in the in the chat about you know where this might come in most useful well i would say newspapers especially because you, you have you have you have so many typographical errors you know that that would be you know something like your trant trant better instead right. of your trial better and and it'll help you uh figure out after after your first search comes up nil you know what's the next one to swap things out and hopefully uh pick somebody up that way 
Right. And the other thing to think about, if, if you're doing a sound deck search and I spell it T-R-O-U and don't find them, changing the O and the A is not going to matter. That's <laughs> yeah. You're just yeah. waiting. And, and the other thing is, it's prevent you from wasting your time. Well, I changed all the vowels and left it at sound decks. I got the same thing. Well, no kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's just we want people to do effective searching, not any more spinning of their wheels. And a lot of us already have to do anyway. Fantastic. Let's go ahead and take a look at the quick start for sounding off on sound deck. So step one is to understand what the sound deck is. Just Google it and see what it says. Step two is to list the surname variants. Step three is to get the sound decks of the variants using um, the sites that Michael talked about. Um, step four is to check the sound decks for, of, of, of the variants that you have. See if they're different. Then you want to, step five is to create a list of variants with, that have the same versus a different sound decks. So those are the steps. Thank you so much. Let's first say hi before we go to the next. Let's first say hello. We have a, uh, people here who were said where they are from. Welcome, everyone. Let's see. Dean Henry always here holding it down for AAGG. Wanda Looney. Hi from Alabama. We have Linda from Florida. We have June from New England. How are you, June? We have Jenny from the sunny Midwest. Yes, it is a nice sunny day, isn't it? We have Wayne from Camden County. Woo woo, always repping Camden County. We have Judy from Chicago Land. Pat from Indy. Love the Midwest. We have Jolene from New Jersey. You know, Jersey girls. What's up, Jolene? Uh, let's see. We have C. Davis from Detroit and Carolyn from Manchester. Another Jersey girl holding it down. Who says great information and entertaining too? She's our new best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and my cousin Charlene. Hey, Charlene, my middle name. I got it from her. All right. So, guys, thank you so much for sounding off. So, I'm going to sound you guys off. One, two, <laughs> three, four. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. That was fun. I like the sound decks. It was really fun, kind of. And one thing I didn't say, look at your driver's license. Your sound decks for your name is probably, possibly on there. I know in New Jersey that our sound decks is at the very, very beginning of our, you know, our driver's license number. All right. You guys ready for our special guests? Yes. Adrian, Adrian, Adrian. Oh my goodness. So I told you guys I got my beating from Miss Othella from Adrian, but you know what? It's all love. Adrian, how are you? I am wonderful. It's so good to be on your show, Shamel. Thank you for being here today. And I just love uh, the topic that you chose. Why do you think that placing your person is such a key thing to do? So I can't tell you how many people I've interacted with who tell me that they've got so many thousands of people in their family tree databases. <laughs> and then I go, great, what are some of the stories that you love about them? And then it's crickets. <laughs> So it's folks who like, they've got a birth date, they've got maybe like a marriage year, they've got the date of death and where that person is buried and like, that's all they have. And I think that it's my job as a family historian to not only know those facts, but to try to understand who that person was and like what their life experiences were actually like. And so you have to dig into the material, you have to find all of the contextual information to try to bring their stories back to life. And that's the fun part of it. Um, Kay Fralick used to say, um, between the dash, right? We have that birth and we have the death. What's going on in between that dash? Exactly. So let's go ahead and go through um, your quick start for placing your person. So um, step one you have is to um, determine a person, place, and time. Exactly. So I'm going to just, it's, so it's so hard for people to just focus on one, Adrian. I did a survey and asked people to pick one surname. I can't tell you how many times I got five surnames. When you're doing this, Adrian suggests what? One 
person. You can come back and do their wife or their husband later or their children, right? Just one, right, Adrian? Absolutely. Because otherwise you're going to end up chasing and going down a bunch of different rabbit holes. You're going to be like, look, a butterfly. And you're just going to be chasing <laughs> other people. Focus on one, because here's the thing. And I say this both as like a genealogist and a family historian and also someone who like works in a museum and who works in the history field. To, to understand one person's life, you're going to have to look at hundreds, if not thousands of resources. There is so much information that it's possible to get, and you're going to have to do some deep, deep dives. So you can't afford to go chasing down all those other pathways. Stick with this one person, keep like a laser beam focus, see what you can get going as deep as you can, and then worry about picking other people later on. You can get there, you'll do it, or someone else will come after you and will help you to do it. So who's one of, who's the person, one of the people that you fell in love with that you did? Yes. So one of my favorite, favorite people to research recently has been the younger half brother of my two times great grandmother. Her name is Scotney Scott Cooper and her brother, his name is Sidney Borden Scott. And this man has an amazing life. So he is born about 1880, and it looks like both of his parents were enslaved people, one of whom probably came from Virginia, spent the last years of her life as an enslaved person in Georgia, got her freedom after the Civil War, lived for a couple more years and then passed. And then uh, his father, it seems like, lived a good portion of his life in Georgia. Uh, so you've got him. He's coming out of this household where people have experienced enslavement. Somehow, he ends up attending Atlanta Baptist College, which some of you all may know, becomes Morehouse University. So he attends there for some portion of like a high school career, essentially, and then ends up taking their collegiate course. Then he goes to Meharry Medical College and gets a medical degree. Then he moves to Chicago and he goes to the University of Illinois and ends up getting an advanced medical degree and then practices as a doctor, but also as a postal worker for the rest of his life until he passes in 1965. So, I mean, if there's a person to pick, I mean, he's it. And so step one, when you determine a person and a place, you know, you pick uh, Mr. Scott, uh, and this is, tell us about this picture. Yeah, so this is a picture of Atlanta Baptist College. This is from about 1895. This is when Morehouse, is, it's going to later be known, is still sitting like on the outskirts of the city. And so it's just amazing to me to, to look at this image, to see the land around it. And I've been able to find descriptions of what life was like on essentially a daily basis and like who other students were who were attending Atlanta Baptist College at the time that Borden, as he liked to go by, was attending there. And I know that he would have arrived around 1894. So like right before this picture was taken and when he oh. was about 14 years old. So he's coming from a little town in Georgia called Sparta. So imagine him coming from Sparta, Georgia to Atlanta and then attending Atlanta Baptist College. And like, what is the first day like when he is like maybe getting off of a trolley or riding up in a carriage or walking on foot and just sees this massive building in front of him? Like, okay. what is the story that unfolds there? I just, so, I love I love that. So I love the questioning and I like the idea of kind of like putting those down and that's kind of a guide for you to kind of figure that out. Exactly. So let's talk about step uh, two, because I think step two would help to fill in that, those questions. Exactly. So step yeah. two is to create a timeline for your ancestor. So why timelines? Because otherwise you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> the short version <laughs> of that answer. So, you know, again, like what is happening between the dash, right? Like in that dash moment. So 1880 to 1965, you probably have a lot of information about whoever your person is, because that's sort of the, the base level that you input into whatever your um, lineage software is, or if you're using like an ancestry or something like that, like they're going to give you a timeline. Now, what I tend to do is I go a little bit crazy. So I know one of the images that we have is from my blog. And you can see actually a timeline that I've got put up for uh, one of my great granddaughters. I love this, Adrian, because it focus. It almost. It's kind of. I'm not going to get on the blog tip, but if you want to deepen your research, write a blog because you can do it little by little. So you have this area called the timeline roundup. So go ahead and tell us about it. 
Yeah. So essentially, I've been doing this research at this point for goodness, a well over 15 years, and I have a lot of information. So what happens if I walk outside and I get hit by a bus? No good, right? <laughs> <laughs> All of that information is like on a password protected computer and like trapped in my head and in the cloud where, you know, only certain people know how to access it. So it doesn't seem fair in my mind for me to have all of this just in my head and in my computer. I need to share it with people. So I've created this blog. And one of the things that I do is when I've got enough information about a person and I've written enough blogs about them, I create basically a timeline about them. And so that way, if a cousin or whoever all the way across the country wants to know about, for example, my uh, great grandmother, Catherine Jane, Shepherd. Oh, I love this. Click on her name and they could see a picture of her and then an outline of like the basic points in her life. And these yeah. links are to the blog posts that exactly. talk about this. Yeah. I mean, like, just if you think about your blog post as maybe just talking about one document at a time, right? That's uh -huh. kind of what you did. You talked about one document at a time, you provided as much context as you could. Uh -huh. And over time, it became a timeline. So I love that. Create a timeline for your ancestor. Yeah. So um, you had mentioned your lineage software is probably the best place because that's where you should be putting your stuff, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. But let me tell you, so like I've got my roots magic going on, but I also, you should see my files. I have Word documents, timelines. I've got Excel spreadsheets, like depending on how nitty gritty and crazy I need to get with the information, yes. like how I need to cite sources and things like yes. that. I have so many different formats for doing this. And I tell people just find what works for you. But, but like, the thing of it is, is that what drives all of those other timelines is having your main archive, which is your lineage software up to date and everything comes out of that. So um, you could tell we could get all nerdy about the timelines, but let's move on to step three, which is to use timelines to learn history. Cause you can create your ancestor, but what about you have to put them on a historical timeline. So talk exactly. to us about that. It's all about what is the context of his or her life, right? So like as you create the timeline for your ancestor, one of the things you should be doing is you should be looking for gaps in it. So like what are the places where I don't have information? And then again, start from when they were born and when they died and think about what are all of the things that happened during the span of this person's life, not only based on what I know about the person, but also what is happening geographically in, for example, the town that they're in, the the city, the county, the region, the state, the nation, internationally, what all is going on? Because any number of those things can be impacting your specific person's life experience. But then think about other timelines that you might want to look at. So for example, if your ancestor is a woman, what is happening in terms of women's rights? What are the sorts of jobs that women are holding at this point in time? Like you can get really deep into this in terms of like the legality of women's experiences, whether they're able to own property or not, can they vote? All different things. What about race? What's happening with like African American history, for example? What's going on with religion? What is the church that they've been attending? Did they change churches during at some point in their timeline? Is that reflective of something that happened within the broader church history? Mm -hmm. What if they're a coal miner? What if they're a farmer? I've got family members who were growing cotton in Montgomery, Alabama, and then they end up in the Birmingham region as a coal miners. And that's specifically because we know things were happening with the bull weevil, right? And the yes. cotton crops were being decimated. Yes. So even like that kind of work history matters. And then we have all seen in the past year that public health makes a difference on individual oh, lives, right? Yes. So like what is happening in the land of disease, right? What is happening yes. on any number of fronts? Because all of those things actually are probably impacting your person's timeline and therefore their story. So let's talk about some resources for that. My favorite is um, the Schomburg, um, which is a part of the, uh, it's a Center for Black Culture and History in New York, part of the New York Public Library. I probably got their name wrong, but just know Schomburg, New York Public Library. And they have a website called In Motion, and it talks about all these different migrations. Um, when you go there, you can click on any of the migrations. And once you select a migration, you can um, see uh, details about that migration. I clicked on a domestic slave trade. And so they have maps, they have images, they have text in here. Um, it's just a fascinating way to view this history. I will just caution you of one thing 
and that is that the um, Flash, this website is driven by Flash. And you know what that means. It's going to be a little clunky in areas, but the references and the resources is really what you want here. And of course, I want to show you some books really quick. Let me look at the time. All right. So Adrian was like, you have to look at every area. So this is like, I found this book at some like cheap place. I don't know whether it was Book Trader in Philly. I don't know whether it was Strand Books in New York, but it's timelines of history and it covers history, politics, literature, science. And you just go to any year and you can see the details. Um, great way to look at history might be the complete front pages of the New York Times. I love, you could just flip to your decade and just see. What was on the front page? Um, she talked about history of medicine. Here is a timeline history of medicine. I love looking at those crazy tools they have. Um, they have press history of African-American history. So you can, there's a uh, text on that. Um, I think maybe one more, maybe two more. WPA guide. You can learn about the 1930s in your area. You can find these books for cheap in places um, online, Amazon. Don't have to do Amazon. And you can look at your own area, keeping hearth and home in old Alabama. So your particular area, they have ones like what was life like during the civil war. So, and then there's another one that you can get your family to remember the time. And so it goes kind of like decade by decade and it'll have pages where it'll show like what's going on and you could maybe put some family milestones. So that's another way to maybe think about creating a timeline. So I'm that jealous of your bookshelf, Shamel. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go out and buy some more things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to step four, which is to locate resources. And so um, where do you go for that, Adrian? Yeah, so this is when, all right, you've got your all your different timelines. You've figured out, okay, here's some gaps in my ancestor story. This is when you're narrowing it down. Okay, so here's the one thing that I want to look into. So let's say that your ancestor was in Chicago in 1919, and you want to know more about whether they would have interacted with like the Chicago race riots. So mm. number one, look up books. Right. My favorite website to go to to find out if a book exists is WorldCat, because yes. WorldCat is essentially like an international catalog of all of the books that most of the libraries in the world have. And you yes. can go in there and you can choose a book or you can type in like a theme or something and they'll tell you, OK, here are the books that are available or yes, this book is available close to you. And then here is what I do, because I am a nerd and everybody needs to be nerdy like this. Yay, and nerds. Exactly. You got to lean into this if you've got a really <laughs> strong genealogist, because good genealogists are good historians. <laughs> so choose one book on that topic and then scroll down to see what the subject themes are for that book. Adrian, pause. Yeah. I learned two weeks ago that scrolling is a challenge. So I want you to not go past the scroll. Like when you see the book, you want to move down the page you go all, you every page you go onto on the web you go all the way till you can't go to till you get to the end yes and yeah, that's when you see the stuff. juicy stuff right adrian exactly exactly so you're going to see something that says like subject themes or something along those lines and it might say like chicago race race riots or something along those lines click on that subject and what it's going to do is it's going to take you to all of the other books that are also fitting underneath that subject heading so now instead of having one book to look at now you've got maybe 15 books to look at or 30 books to look at so start with that but okay don't just use books right use articles Surf the internet, look for blog posts, look for videos, look for documentaries. And as a museum nerd, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> museums and historical societies have great resources. So look for the places that are in the area where your ancestor was, call them, send them an email, ask them what they got. And then, so that's the secondary sources. So on the screen, we have a primary source. This is from a newspaper from 1908 from Tennessee, and it's announcing the uh, 1908 commencement for Meharry Medical College, which is where Sidney Borden Scott attended and graduated in 1908. 
So if you're interested in understanding what a person's educational career is like, see if you can find college course catalogs, see if you can find yearbooks, see if you can find alumni lists, call the school if it still exists, ask them what they have in their archives. Archivists are phenomenal and they will change your life. And then look for newspapers and every other thing. Whenever you come across a topic for an event that you're interested in, start spiraling out on all of the questions that you could ask because there might be sources available. And speaking of which, go back to those books, go to the end, look for the notes, look for all of the resources that are being cited because those that is a gold mine of additional information. And the final thing that I didn't say and I need to say it is in addition to looking for the timelines for whatever the event is that you're looking at, whatever the time period is in your person's life, look for maps for that Ooh, time. You're good. You're queuing me up. Look for maps. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> So after my ancestor goes from Atlanta Baptist College to Meharry Medical College, then he ends up in Chicago at the University of Illinois. So I wanted to understand what is his life like when he's there? So I looked for him in census records because he's there in 1910. I looked for him in city directories. I looked for newspaper articles. I found commencement information there. And I also looked for Sanborn fire insurance maps because I wanted to understand on a nitty gritty level, not just where he lived in relation to other places in the city, but like, was the building stone or was it brick? How many levels of it? When he was walking to the entrance, what did he see across the street? What did those buildings look like? Who else was nearby? And Sanborn fire insurance maps are, they are a treasure for getting that kind of- They're thing. amazing. I um, love Sanborn maps. They're phenomenal. And you can find so many of them digitized online now. A lot of them are available through the Library of Congress. Library of Congress, yes. yes. That's wonderful. But a lot of states now, like I think the Georgia, what is it, like Digital Georgia or something along those lines? Yes. They're putting theirs online. Florida as well. Yes. Yeah. Lots of folks are doing it. So you can probably, if your person lives like in the city proper, you can probably find it for them. It's just so rich and so full of information. They are. It's almost like you're you're walking the street. Um, you can you know if they had some kind of uh, standing foundation, something building in the backyard. Yeah, you know, um, if there was a grocery street. store down the street. Yeah, where the bathrooms are located. <laughs> yeah. if there were stables behind. Like you get all of the detail. I love that. I love that. And if you look up, you might be able to even um, sometimes find insurance records to yeah. co correspond with those. Yeah. Um, so love that. Great ideas on resources. Um, so what do we have for step um, five? Five is to analyze and document your research. I love your how you ended up, Adrian. So what are your um what are you what are you suggesting here yeah so what i always tell people to do is when you're going through this sort of a research process at some point when you feel like you've gathered like a good amount of information you need to write it out you need to sort of ground truth it you need to see if it actually makes sense as a story and so for me what that means is that i put together a blog post and i'm like okay here's everything that i know here's a little story i think this makes sense i'm going to share it with the world and then that does a couple of things. Number one, if there are errors in that, somebody will tell me <laughs> in a very public forum. <laughs> but number two, it also acts as cousin bait, which I think is beautiful. People will like Google a person's name. They'll come across my blog and then we'll be in touch, which is wonderful. So yeah, this is my blog, kinterested.blogspot.com. But what it also does is the process of writing a story out lets me know if I don't have the right information. If there's something missing, if I made an assumption that I shouldn't have made, if there's a hole that I actually need to fill, trying to turn that information, those different points on a timeline and all of the secondary and other primary source info we've pulled together, if when I put that into a story, it doesn't make sense, I have to stop myself. I have exactly. to go back and say, here's the other stuff I need to get in order for this to work. And then exactly. I love that because it's almost therapeutic. Uh -huh. It's therapeutic and it's a great review. Um, writing a blog post, I had that you have to do research in your home. Uh -huh. And I found like the oldest document that I that I have that I didn't even know that I had until I was writing a blog post. And so everyone, if you don't have a blog, just just Share with your family. You know what I loved about your blog is 
when I was looking for Sydney Scott, I just put in the surname or I clicked on the surname. So if I'm related to you on that branch, uh -huh. I just search for it and I see all of the stories related to that. So it is a beautiful archives. It's a beautiful, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, honor to your ancestors. And you spent all of this money and time collecting all of this stuff and energy. Oh Yes. Put it to good use. So this is your this is your blog. I love the title. <laughs> <laughs> that was me and my mom sitting across from each other in a restaurant with a napkin and a pen. Like, okay, I'm gonna. What am I gonna call it? What's it gonna be? <laughs> so let let me go through your quick start. Thank you, Adrian. Placing your people. Step one is to determine a person, one person, a place and a time. Step two is to create a timeline for your ancestor. Step three is to use timelines to learn history. Step four, locate as many resources as you can. Step five is to analyze and document your research. So thank you, Adrian. Let me bring back my buddies. And we, that was an amazing quick start. You guys, thank you. Yes. Two three quick starts. Any questions in the audience? Anything come through? So let's see. Did I miss any questions, guys? I don't think so. So I love the question of the, what's our question of the day? And this is for everybody, even the audience. What's our question of the day? Who came up with it? I love it. With the name. I came up with it. I, I take the blame. I'll put it that way. <laughs> So what's our question of the day? Who is your favorite pet? No, the question <laughs> of the day was, oh, geez, now I forgot exactly how I phrased it. Unusual um, ancestor name? Your favorite unusual ancestral first name. I mean, I, I, we all may like William or James, but if we've got a name, the intent is a name one. that's a little bit different and one that you really like for, for whatever, one reason or another. I have one and it's square because it made no sense. And I thought that my aunt, it was a nickname, but square or squire, it depends on the accent, is a very common name down south. So I thought that was pretty cool. Square. Square Daniels. Big I up to my aunt. My I like that. Yeah, we've got a squire. Yeah. <laughs> what are you guys' names? Well, I'm, I'm going to go with my dad's mother, whose first name was Dora. Okay. And, and uh, I mean, she's, she's the only, she's the only real life Dora I've ever known. And, and the funny thing is now, you know, I grew up in the sixties with Bewitched and on Bewitched, the mother, the mother's name is Endora. Oh. And, and, and I confused a little bit when I first, when I first heard that my grandmother's you know, that she wasn't just grandma, that her name was Dora. I'm like, you mean Andorra? Like one bewitched? She, <laughs> she was not terribly impressed by that. Uh, yeah. Adrian, Michael, yeah. either one. So my favorite family, I had two written down, but I've decided to skip over those two. My <laughs> actual favorite is my two times great grandmother. So actually Sydney Borden Scott's sister. And her name is Scotney. And oh, you, I saw her. <laughs> yes, yes, the amazing picture, and she's got an awesome hat standing in front of a church. So imagine trying to find the name Scotney in records. <laughs> this is when you really need the sound X, right? I have seen her as Scatney, Sudney, Scotney, like every variable with every vowel and version <laughs> of T's and it makes no sense. I'm Michael. <laughs> I'm gonna go with my my great grandmother, whose first name was Joda. T J O D E. That's a, a low German name that in that part of Germany is not that uncommon, but it's fairly. That's a cool name. That's yeah, a, I, I always, I always like that name. I see Bud. I see Aura. I see Odie. I see Free Gift. Is that a name? Or are you asking for a free gift? I'm not sure. I think someone said thankful. Um, all right. I've got, I've got a thankful, yeah, and a remembrance. If you've got early New England people, you've got names in that general category. Mm -hmm. All right, probably. guys. Thank you so much for another fantastic show. Thank you for watching. You guys have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone.
Bye.